Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is John Cromarty, and I'm chair of the North of Scotland group of the Scottish Wildlife Trust. So a particularly warm welcome tonight to those of you who are joining us from Uist, um, and in particular from uh, Linnacliff School. Uh, I think we have some teachers and some pupils joining us from there, so a very warm welcome to you. And we also hope with our very large local group in the north of Scotland that we have participants here from many of the other Scottish islands within our northern uh, boundary. And that would include Lewis, Harris, Skye, Orkney and Shetland. And of course, to all of you members who are joining us from the other local groups throughout Scotland, uh, a very warm welcome to this meeting of the, the North of Scotland local group. Um, and this is a, a national webinar, as Jill has said. So it's great to have so many participants from across Scotland uh, tonight. We're very fortunate this evening to have Professor Stuart Angus with us uh, as our speaker. And Stuart's going to be speaking to us about US and, and climate change. Stuart is a Lewis man. Um, after a brief spell teaching in his native island, he joined the Nature Conservancy Council as their assistant regional officer for Sutherland a post which he held for seven years before moving back to Lewis for the Nature Conservancy Council. On the formation of Scottish Natural Heritage, Stuart became the first area manager for the Western Isles, transferring to the specialist arm of the organisation some five years later to become coastal ecology manager. When in Sutherland, he wrote the first report on the impact of afforestation in the flow country and compiled Sutherland birds with legendary figures such as Desmond Nethersold Thompson, Donny McLeod, and Ian Rennie. He read his first scientific paper at the age of 23 when still a teacher uh, to the Royal Society of Edinburgh. His return to the Western Isles marked the start of a long obsession, as he calls it, with Macha, as well as founding Curacag, uh, the Western Isles Natural History Society. He is the author of two books on the natural history of the Outer Hebrides and has published a wide range of papers on the islands covering history as well as the environment. He is now working on a range of papers uh, on the islands and uh, on salt marsh ecosystem function, mainly on the impact of climate change. Stuart's career as a professional conservationist includes involvement in Linger Bay, Many Links and Cool Links public inquiries. He is an honorary professor at Heriot Watt University an honorary senior lecturer in geosciences at the University of Aberdeen and a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland. So that's a, a brief synopsis of uh, some of Stuart's background, uh, but uh, a considerable uh, accomplishment and a wide range of achievements um, across a diverse range of subjects with a focus, as I say, on, on climate change now. Just before I hand over to Stuart, I'm just going to let you know that immediately following his presentation in the question and answer session, uh, this is going to be chaired by Kenny Taylor. And uh, Kenny uh, will be well known to, to many of you. Um, he chaired the North of Scotland group prior to me, and he did so for six years, as well as chairing the Conservation Society uh, Committee of the Scottish Wildlife Trust. Kenny is the author also of several books and is a respected writer, broadcaster, on natural history, environmental studies, uh, and popular science. We're very fortunate to be able to persuade Kenny to stay on our North of Scotland local group committee to help out following his two terms of office as chair. I'm very glad that he's able to join us and be with us tonight to chair our discussion following the presentation. So just prior to uh, handing over now to Stuart to give us his presentation, um, uh, I would just reiterate what Jill has said at the beginning of our talk, which is please submit any comments or questions that you may have for, for Stuart during the course of the presentation, uh, preferably, um, so that we have a good range of questions to stimulate and start off our discussion at the end of his presentation. So thank you very much. And I'm going to hand over to you now, Stuart. Thank you very much. Thank you. Has that worked okay? Yes. 
Well, good evening. The slide shows the three organisations that I'm involved with, obviously, Scottish Wildlife Trust tonight. But I put the Nature Scott logo in there to enable me to show slides that feature data sets licensed to the organisation. And I, I feel I have to stress that I'm speaking tonight as an individual and certainly not on behalf of any of these organisations. Well, I should say first karma, which is the Gaelic for good evening. And this is the only fake news in the entire presentation, I assure you. This is an oyster catcher photographed in Shetland, a shalder. And of course, being in well, Shetland. Sorry to interrupt, Stuart. Sure. I think your I think your slides aren't people aren't able to see your slides. Can you try sharing them again, please? Okay, we'll do. Might need to just do stop sharing and start again. It's Has that worked? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, there we go. Perfect. Thank you. Jolly good. Well, this is somewhat stolen my thunder. The the oyster catcher is a Shetland oyster catcher, a shalder, and of course wouldn't have spoken Gaelic. I'm going to put my thanks at the beginning for two reasons. One is to emphasize that my gratitude to these organizations and the individuals in the next slide is not some sort of afterthought but also because I don't want any confusion in thinking between the, the acknowledgements and the last few slides. The, the last few slides are designed to be particularly thought provoking. And these individuals have helped immeasurably in establishing communication and providing ideas that have contributed to this talk. So thank you all. These are the islands we're talking about from North Uist to South Uist, and I'm sure you all know that already. Setting the scene first, it's necessary to look at global climate change. Now, Scotland's got a pretty good record in reducing its carbon emissions, but Scotland's a tiny country, and we're dependent really on the actions of other countries to see if they'll follow suit. And even with zero emissions in Scotland, there could be huge impacts on climate change from other countries. On the other hand, global climate change can have a major impact on Scotland, especially because we're very much a coastal nation. Much of the assets of our country are situated on the coast, and the coast means a great deal to people in ways that you can't measure financially. And it's less a question of can we afford to address the problems of climate change on the coast than can we afford not to. However, adapting to all this climate change requires a policy lead from the government, which they are providing in the link at the bottom of the slide. But that policy has to be well informed. And as part of that, scientists are advising the government on how the coast works, including the scientists in Nature Scott. And the Coastal Change Adaptation Plan guidance has recently become available online, and I have a slide from that later on. I want to emphasize that everything in UST is connected. Habitats, people, culture, climate, you name it. We need to understand how the environment works so that we can anticipate how it might respond to climate change. And in that context, it's really important to link science and local knowledge together, because together they can contribute so much more than the sum of the parts. It has been said, perhaps by Mark Twain, that there are only two certainties in life, death and taxes. I dispute this because there's a third. Coasts change. There's no way around it. They change on different scales at different rates. And some of the change is cyclical, which runs the risk 
of creating false information about trends? How do you separate the two? Answer, you need very long data sets and we have very, very few of these. You also have to recognize that people perceive change with great unease. And it's often interpreted as threat, often wrongly, but sometimes obviously correctly. So how do you define threat and who defines it? Now, a lot of this talk is going to address sea level rise. It could hardly be otherwise, but it's important to recognize that when I'm referring to sea level rise, I'm referring to relative sea level rise that takes account of the fact that the land also changes level. So it's relative to the level of the land. Sea level rise isn't the only game in town when it comes to climate change. So we'll be looking at these other aspects and altogether in UIST, I suggest that there are eight components, all of which relate to each other. I'm going to try and build this up in layers. And the mantra that should really run through this entire talk is everything is connected. Well, let's have a look at the sort of habitats we're dealing with in UIST. You will almost all have heard of Macher, and there is no doubt that UIST is the global headquarters of this wonderful habitat. It sits within a wider Macher ecosystem that runs from the, the near inshore right through the beach and the dunes and inland to marshes and lochs. In addition, we have some fairly spectacular saline lagoons in Uist. And in terms of habitats and their adaptation and management, it's extremely useful to look at loch basins. And I'm deliberately using the word loch rather than river because it's just the way things work in Uist. That is an example of what Macher can look like. This is taken on the Balranald RSPB reserve in North Uist. You see the, the colour imparted to this wonderful landscape by its land use. And as if that were not enough, you have the wonderful lump of St Kilda available on the horizon. Looking at South Uist from the air, I'm, a, I'm sorry this is such an old and fuzzy slide, but it suggests that the land actually slopes downwards inland away from the sea. I'm afraid this isn't an optical illusion, this is real. It's a habitat with multiple interest, not just within the natural heritage, but also the human historical heritage in terms of landscape and of course in terms of culture. Lagoons are not the most photogenic of habitat. So I, I picked a, a picture with some lagoon scientists in it from the National Museum of Scotland. This is Loch B at the north end of South Uist. And there are some particular lagoon organisms. We see two of them clearly in this picture. On the left, we have the bird's nest stonewort, Tolipella nidifica, which is an alga. And this particular organism is restricted to two sites in the UK, both in North Uist. And in the middle, we have what looks like a common cockle. It isn't. It's a closely related species, the lagoon cockle. And these are restricted to saline lagoons. These are locks that are partly invaded by the sea, but are not quite as saline as the sea. They're brackish. We have eight specialist lagoon species in Scotland out of a UK total of about 38, which doesn't sound great. But Uist is the headquarters of this habitat in Scotland, in terms of biodiversity at least, because three Uist lochs, Loch Anun, Loch Anstruvor and Loch B, have seven out of the eight each. And the highest number you get elsewhere is three. Now, I mentioned we're talking about relative sea level rise at all times here. This operates at different rates across Scotland. 
And in this context, we have to be aware of this rather frightening piece of advice from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that even if you achieve global net zero, which at the moment seems rather far off, sea level rise will continue for centuries. So we really do have to be looking at adaptation. I want you to think what parts of Scotland would be vulnerable to sea level rise. You're probably thinking soft coasts on a low-lying coastline with wetlands near sea level and with a highly exposed seaboard. And you probably come up with a list close to or even identical to that. My colleagues, Alistair Rennie and Jim Hansen, have written a paper on sea level rise in Scotland based on actual observations, not predictions. And the map on the right is the one I want to draw to your attention because it is based on 15 years of measurement between 1992 and 2010, sorry, 17 years. And you will see that the areas experiencing the highest measured rates of sea level rise are exactly the areas listed in the last slide. Orkney, Uist, Tyree, and Western Isla. The report I mentioned from Dynamic Coast shows us this diagram of projected relative sea level rise. And the third colored column here, Stornoway, is the nearest we've got to Uist. And it suggests that using the least optimistic scenarios, by 2100, the end of this century, sea level could have risen by a meter relative to 1990. And below that, you see that, again, with the worst case scenario, the annual rate of relative sea level rise in the Outer Hebrides could be as high as 16 millimeters a year. In the paper on measured sea level rise, Rennie and Hansen pointed out that there are tipping points in the environment, and one of them is reckoned to exist around an annual sea level rise rate of three to four millimetres a year, beyond which you start to get major reorganisation of soft coasts. What would that look like? Well, we can look to history for some hints here. The Papal Charter of Inchaffray of 1389 mentions at the bottom of the screen here some penny lands, some townships in Ullara, which is part of what is now Ballyshire, off the west coast of North Uist. And it mentions the township of Husabost. So in 1389, there was a town called Husabost. This would have been on the west of this landmass here. This is Ballyshire, seen from the air, and you see that this is very low lying and very watery. Now, Ballyshire means east town, suggesting at some stage there was a west town. Perhaps that west town was Husabost because that is what is likely to be the remains of Husabost. It is a cluster of rocks called Shkir Husabost on the west coast of Ballyshire, and saddle querns have been taken out of here by a crofter, strongly suggesting that this was in fact a settlement. So this is the sort of major change we could be looking at. Secondly, we have vast kelp beds off the west of the U.S. and the particulate and dissolved organic matter generated by that kelp basically drives marine ecology inshore. When the kelp is washed up on the beach, it supports vast biomass of invertebrates in the form of fly and beetle larvae, which in turn provide a very important food supply for international numbers of migrant birds. And even when the seaweed is washed away, the ooze transforms the beach fauna. And crofters use this kelp, taking it from the beach and spreading it on the land prior to ploughing to grow their fodder crops on the macher. 
That is what a kelp bed looks like underwater. And the kelp extends a very long way out to sea, but as a kelp forest, it extends to a depth of around 20 metres, represented here by the darker blue shading on the Admiralty chart. And that represents a distance west of land of seven kilometres. That's an extremely important kelp bed because as the waves pass over that kelp bed, the effort involved in moving that kelp, particularly the stiff but not rigid stipe or stem of that kelp, absorbs wave energy. And by the time a wave has passed over seven kilometres of the stuff, it's lost an awful lot of its energy. The problem is, if sea level is raised, either by sea level or, as we will see, by weather conditions, the wave base disengages from the seabed and the kelp that would have absorbed its energy. So that when you have seas that are physically higher, they can also possess far more of their energy when they hit the western seaboard of Uist. So if sea level rises, would that kelp not grow to meet the new sea level? Well, not necessarily. That would take precious resources from the kelp plant. And apart from when the kelp is shedding bits and pieces, and you get all this particulate organic matter in the water column, which is fairly short-lived. Apart from then, the water is very clear, and there'd be no reason for the kelp to grow vertically to meet rising sea level. So as sea level rises, there will be a progressive disengagement of this wave base. That's what it looks like in winter on a beach in US, though it can often be much, much higher than that. Thirdly, drainage. You look at a map of US, you will see drains everywhere. These are critically important to the maintenance of the land for agriculture but also to the dispersal of flood water. However, because the land is so low lying, they only work when the tide is out for the simple reason that that's the only time the sea is lower than the inland water. Low tide as part of sea level is rising. So as the sea level rises, the efficiency of these drains is failing. In addition to which, you will have less time during the tidal cycle for the discharge of that flood water. Some of the drains have valves, some don't. And the ones that don't have valves, such as the very large row glass, which I'll show you a picture of, allow saline inflow at high tide, sometimes as much as a kilometer and a half inland. Now this drainage started, we believe, in 1744. Since 1750, sea level rise has risen by about a third of a metre. And as you see, as you saw from the diagram in the government strategy document, you could have almost another metre on top of that by the end of this century. Some of the drains almost resemble canals. And it's interesting that in Gaelic, the word licky can mean either a drain or canal. And when the English is used, it is applied to both drains and canals. So when is a drain not a drain? Well, it's not a simple argument at all. This is Castle Ormaclet, or all that remains of it, constructed on the western seaboard of Uist at the beginning of the 1700s. That's a reconstruction built in the style of a French chateau, which has been alleged by some commentators. And this is a, a more traditional reconstruction done by John Raven, who now works for Historic Environment Scotland. Sorry, part of his thesis, he didn't do it himself. The important aspect of Castle on Cliff is that it is built from materials that are not local to the location. It contains materials 
from Stulai, which you see located on the bottom right of this diagram, but it also contains limestone from either Sky or the mainland and was roofed, we believe, with Balakulish slate. Remember, constructed in the beginning of the 1700s, there were no roads in South East until 1799. So you have to ask, how did they get the materials across this island? They built canals. There is over a kilometre of constructed canal between the east coast of South East and the west coast of South East to enable, we believe, the construction of Castle on a Clit. Using a lock network and connections between these locks. This is the Ollie North Lock Network, one of four lock systems I will show you in South East. Sometimes you need high technology to detect these canals. This is one between Mid Loch Ollie and West Loch Ollie, that Loch Ollie Nianach and Loch Ollie Nier. It's very difficult to see that from the ground. And we can see on the left the map from Blau's Atlas of 1654. It's the first map of US that was more than a sketch. And this was actually drawn from material supplied by Timothy Plant, who visited US in the, in the 1590s. And it is believed on the basis of this map that he traveled through a navigable inland loch network. And it's interesting that the blockages he shows correspond to what are probably blockages in that loch network today. The diagram in the middle is the digital terrain model of that same area. And I draw your attention to the extent and the linearity of that low-lying area separated from the Atlantic by a ridge of dunes. The one on the right is a reconstruction with depths of that loch network, 13.4 kilometers long. There are four basins, all of them with different characteristics, all of them with different types of discharge. And the one I will be concentrating on today is the Dalabrog one, because firstly, it's the biggest, but also raises some, some interesting issues. Loch B is a saline lagoon at the north end of South Uist and is unique in the UK and very rare in Europe in that it is what is known as a bifurcated loch. It has outflows on two different coasts. Admittedly, the one on the east appears to have been constructed, but that governs its current function. It's also the second largest saline lagoon in the UK after the Loch of Stennis in Orkney. The Dalbrook network is actually two different loch networks, but because we're talking about flooding, I've linked them together. They link together at a flood level of 3.1 meters. This is a reconstruction of the loch depth, the bathymetry of the loch using digital terrain models. And you can see that South Uist was theoretically navigable for 13.4 meters over the Dalabrock network. It was obviously very important in being navigable over this length, and it was important to have links to the East Coast for the importation of cargoes to this loch network. And MacDonald of Boysdale, the brother of Callan Ranald, is believed to have built a canal linking this loch to the sea loch of Loch Boysdale in 1744. It was built as a canal, but as a side product of that construction, it drained 500 hectares, thereby releasing them for agriculture, which was extremely important to the economy of the time, as it is now. And that stimulated the program of drainage construction, which was probably the biggest impact of man on the natural heritage of the Outer Hebrides since the Neolithic. 
I mentioned it as two subcatchments. They're separated at a ridge at Frobost, Frobost with an elevation of 3.1 meters. The south section drains east through what was this old canal at the Stram Jerich into Loch Boisdale, while the north section, north of Frobost, drains west through the Low Glass. And as with the other US Macher lochs, there is a trickling through the beach, the, the, the dune ridge and out through the beach. And that is what it looks like. That is fresh water discharging onto the beach, as any local people with a dog will know because the dogs drink from this discharge. It's not seawater. This is the rural glass. And you see a distinct channel built from the loch towards the sea. Interestingly, this is entirely constructed and replaces an older natural channel, which you see just to the south of that, that was blocked on the construction of the drainage channel in order to make the drainage channel work. That's it using LIDAR. And you can see that it follows what was either low-lying land or low-lying land was created around it. And that's a close-up of the blocked old channel. It used to block naturally anyway and cause flooding, which was part of the problem. And like many drains, it resembles a canal, but this one probably was just a drain despite its appearance. This, the the road glass is not valved. It merely has a grill to stop debris coming back up. And that allows seawater to flow one and a half kilometers inland at high tide. However, the Strand Jerich on the east coast is valved. Fourthly, we have to consider elevation. And much of Western Benbecula and the southern half of South East is below what you might call sea level. These old locks were drained and the lock bed left by that drainage can in some cases be as much as a metre below mean high water springs. And remember that's a mean, it's not an extreme level. The very highest tides would be even higher than that. That's Western Benbecula. One of the checks we've done on the reconstructed locks is to take the very thorough archaeological surveys that have been done on the Macher landscapes and overlay them on the loch outlines. And if the loch outline is wrong, there should be some sort of constructed features visible that will say you, you're barking up the wrong tree here. Interestingly, the only monuments recorded from these old lochs are Cranogs and brochs. In other words, they're exactly what you would expect to find in a loch. One of the most interesting of these is Loch Dalabrock, and the Uistjochs on the call are probably thinking, what? Where's Loch Dalabrock? Well, it no longer exists. It's been completely drained. This is a, a reconstructed loch showing the depths again. And you can see how close it came to the coast there at Kilfedar. This is a digital terrain model of the same area using laser scanning from an aircraft, a technology called LIDAR, that gives you a very accurate measure of the height every meter. And it shows that the lowest land, which was at the bottom of Loch Dalabrock and is now at the edge of the drain that runs through it, is around a meter below the level of mean high water springs. This is the LIDAR model and what it shows you is not only the low lying land, but it shows you that the dune ridge diminishes in width and height to almost nothing at this bulge in the, the low lying land on the coast at Kilfedar. 
Now, the history of this loch is quite important because the archaeological remains there are absolutely riddled with cockle shells over a huge area. They clearly had access to vast cockle beds. However, these are common cockles, not lagoon cockles, and it suggests that until perhaps 1000 AD, Loch Dalabrog was actually open to the sea. Today, that narrow lip in the dunes is easily seen in this reconstruction by my colleague Alistair Rennie, who, it has to be stressed, has exaggerated the vertical axis here to make things clearer. And you see two things here. Well, three, actually. First is confirmation that the land slopes downwards away from the coast. Secondly, that the dune ridge disappears at this lip in the coast. And the third is that when erosion takes chunks out of this lip, as it surely will, it not only removes the extent from the coast, it lowers the, the elevation of that lip and makes marine overtop overtopping that bit more likely. That's what it looks like on the ground. Fifthly, we have saline intrusion. Now, salt water is toxic to any organism that is not adapted to that salt water. The water table is so high in winter that it's in surplus and the land has a lot of water lying on the surface, but it's very low in summer. After the flood, we took salinity measurements of the seasonal locks that lie just behind the dunes. And there is no question that these were incorporated in the marine flood of January 2005. And five weeks later, they should still have been fairly salty. They weren't. The salt level was about a third or less of that of seawater. Now, these locks have no discharge to the sea and no inflow. They could not have been flushed. So our theory was that they're actually surplus water table and the surface of the water table is in chemical contact with the subsoil part of the water table so that the two equalize. Now, if your flood only lasts 24 hours as that one did, it's a superb adaptation. However, if your flood by the sea is prolonged or repeated, that adaptation becomes a liability because the salt water is going to contaminate your water table. Now, there are already places where the sea gets in in US. I'll show you pictures of the North US locks that are that have a very high level of connectivity to the sea. You've seen Balasher, where you get flooding not only from the west, but from the east. The Homor estuary, you've seen Kilfeder, and you've seen the, the drain that backflows at the Rogue Glass. Well, this is the Homor estuary. And you can see how when the tide comes in here, the salt water will penetrate the locks that are connected to this river. And in North Uist, it can be very difficult to distinguish seawater from freshwater. And in fact, there is a, a lot of overlap between the two because of the high connectivity again. They, there are a lot of saline lagoons in North Uist. One of the functional aspects of saline lagoons is that when the weather is calm or warm or both, the water in the lagoon stratifies. And this can be so developed that the difference between the two layers is visible underwater. The water on the top has a lower salinity and thus a lower density and is effectively floating on the denser, more saline water below. And this has huge implications for the way these ecosystems will react to climate change. In calm conditions, seawater will flow 
in at high tide over the sill and trickle downwards into the more saline layer below. Meanwhile, any rain or freshwater inflow will enter the lower salinity level above this distinct layer, the halocline. And when the tide goes out, it will be this low salinity water that flows out. And when the tide comes in, it's salt water that flows in. And that lagoon will slowly get more saline until high winds disrupt the process, disrupt the layer again. What impact is this going to have on the species that live there, the specialist species, especially as more salt water is going to get in? It's not that the, the lagoon specialists can't cope with the high salinity, they can. It's that most of them have very closely related marine counterparts and these marine counterparts will outcompete the lagoon species in marine conditions. Now, as sea level rise progresses, more freshwater lochs will be captured as lagoons. But the problem is these organisms are rare because they have limited dispersal powers. Can they make the move to the site that corresponds to the current one? We don't know. We doubt it. So we have three options. We can just look at the situation and report on it. We can intervene in selected sites to ensure that the sea exchange is raised at a rate similar to the rate of sea level rise, or you can translocate the vulnerable species to their corresponding new site when their old one is replaced by a fully saline inlet. The problem is you need an awful lot of information to enable you to do that. So it isn't that we have to make the choice now, we have to collect information in a way that enables us to make the choice in the future. We don't actually know how far the saline intrusion onto the surface can spread through the water table. This could be significant because if you have four used catchments, each of these will have a water table, but what if they collect the constructed canals between these loch basins? This is where one of them might have been, and it's possible they used the chain of seasonal lochs in winter to move cargoes between these loch basins, and it's possibly assisted this process by building canals, and that these have been buried by subsequent coastal dynamism. However, that might have preserved connectivity at the water table level, and it is possible, perhaps not all that likely, but it is possible that the whole of South Uist has a single water table. Rainfall. Now, Uist is not as wet as some people would have you believe. We have two long-term data sets here, 30-year data sets, and they don't show much change in the annual rainfall. They show considerable changes in its distribution. More of it is now falling in spring and autumn, which are the times you would be plowing or harvesting, and less of it is falling in summer when you need crops to grow. Now, for most of the crop, the autumn rainfall doesn't really matter because the crop is taken as silage. However, not all of it is taken as silage. You have to wait for the seed corn to ripen so that it can be harvested properly and used as a seed source in the following year because these seeds are not available commercially. They have to be grown from local stock. This is also uh, a problem if you're growing barley for distilleries as it's now planned. Just to make the situation even worse, winter precipitation is projected to increase and in some scenarios increase significantly. Air pressure also plays its part in this. Now, standard air pressure is just over a thousand hectopascals or millibars. 
If it's above this, it's high pressure. If it's below, it's low pressure. The thing is that every millibar changes sea level by one centimeter or very nearly. It means that the depression that caused the storm in 2005, which was 944 hectopascals, and that is not a record low for Scotland, that is 925. The 944 one alone raised sea level by 69 centimetres above the level of the predicted tide. This picture was taken from the Met Office website, just in case anybody wants to argue with any of the concepts involved. But it shows you uh, a surge associated with a cyclonic storm. And you can see this bulge of water that is driven by the storm towards the islands. That also raises sea level. And when this gets into the North Sea, it, it can be funneled and it's actually a storm surge that caused the serious flood in 1953 in which a lot of people died. So in addition to sea level rise, we have low pressure associated with storms raising sea level, raising the wave base so that you're more likely to get wave overtopping. Additionally, it's just when air pressure is at its lowest that rainfall is at its highest. So getting rid of the flood water associated with that storm becomes more difficult because the tide hasn't gone out so far. Mean high water springs in southeast is in terms of ordinary survey heights, 2.07 meters. Obviously, there are higher tides than that, especially at the equinoxes. Now, these are astronomical tides, meteorological tides caused by air pressure and storm systems are superimposed on this so that your observed tide can be very different from the predicted one. The flood level of the 2005 storm was 4.6 metres, but it was a purely marine flood. The previous 24 hours had had no rainfall. So 4.6 is what we've already seen. Loch Dalabrock will merge into a single catchment at a flood level of 3.1 metres. And the real danger point, ecologically, at least, and possibly in, in terms of what local people will experience, the danger point comes at five metres when the four catchments merge on the macher. You can see in these aerial pictures just how flat line this is. The, this is the land between Loch, the, the sea and Loch B at the north end of South East. And this is the south end of South East looking towards Loch Boysdale. And when the sea seems to be higher than the land, sometimes it is. And in storm conditions, that can be a bit scary, to put it mildly. Water doesn't just have level, it has chemistry, not just salinity, but all sorts of other things as well, like pH. Remember that water coming into the macher is acid, and by the time it leaves, it's alkaline because of all the shell. Water can also have energy, and the speed at which the water moves will determine the amount and also the coarseness of the sediment it carries. There are also things that live in the water. So we have this huge legacy of drainage and to a lesser extent canals, so that we have to understand this old system, basically to know where we're going, we need to know where we've been. And that's where local knowledge is particularly key. And I would not have figured this out without access to that local knowledge. When the catchments merge, you get the water chemistry becoming all mixed up, sediment moved around, animals and perhaps plants also moved around. Now, a system of classifying lochs reckons there are 11 types of water body in the UK. Incredibly, all 11 of these 
occur between the sound of Harris and the sound of Barra, nine of these at altitudes below 10 meters. So imagine a worst case scenario where the storm has raised the sea level. This coincides with a high spring tide. The wave base is raised above the kelp, so it retains more of its energy so that waves are more over likely to overtop the dune ridge and cause a marine flood. In addition, you get heavy rainfall that cannot discharge because sea level is too high, and you get a freshwater flood on top of a saline flood, and that can be an awful lot of water. The salt water can cause crop failure if it hangs around long enough or happens at the wrong time. The crofts can be flooded septic tanks flooded with all the health risks associated with that. And there is a disruption of transport, which remember can include emergency vehicles. And in extreme circumstances, as we saw in 2005, infrastructure can be destroyed and appallingly people can lose their lives. So trying to improve the mood a bit, what can we do? Well, I did some work with Jim Hansen, who is a professor at University of Glasgow. And we published this paper that basically describes what I have just described to you, but then proposes a strategy for how we improve the resilience of UIST. This strategy has absolutely no status other than the science is believed to be sound having been subject to and passed peer review by other scientists. When your land is so low lying and lies below the level of the sea, you obviously need a very efficient barrier between you and the sea. Now we know because of the number of places the sea gets in that that barrier is not efficient. So we have to improve its resilience as much as possible. The higher it is, the more likely it is to resist overtopping by the waves. And the wider it is, the less likely it is to be breached. And there are two things you can do to promote these aspects. Firstly, you still take your seaweed just as before, provided there is enough of it. You leave a band of perhaps five meters at the top of the beach. The reason being that this band contains the seeds of plants, and most importantly, it constitutes a source of nutrients for these plants to grow. The seaweed traps sand, and then when the plants grow, they too trap sand, and they promote the growth of fordun, which in time can transform into actual dune. This is not an automatic process. In most years, it'll get washed away the following winter, but in some years it won't. And this is the value of having zero cost, provided there is enough seaweed around. It's just a bit more inconvenient because you've got to take the seaweed from lower down. Secondly, you can reduce grazing on the dune ridge. This is not specifically to reduce the grazing itself, though that can help. It's to reduce the hoof impact of the grazing animals on the structure of marum grass because their activities destabilize the dune artificially. You need to have coordination of any response to these between townships because of this. The, the low lying land behind the dunes is linear. It means that if the sea gets through, it's not just going to flood at that location. It's going to carry on sideways and flood adjacent townships. And you need to manage the whole dune ridge in a unified way for this to work, to get nature-based solutions to do the job for you. That illustrates what seaweed can do. Admittedly, this example is from Harris rather than Lewis, but it shows uh, a fairly dramatic difference in height between 
the, the beach with seaweed remnants on it and the, the beach that has no seaweed remnants on it. And this was early June, quite early in the growing season, but you can also really see plants growing on this seaweed deposit. It will also be intercepting sand, new sand, even at this stage. In time, these four dunes can grow into full dunes. And you can see at Luskintyre here, again, an example from Harris, where the dune has advanced beyond a clear old dune ridge here. And there are similar examples to be seen in Uist, for example, at Macher Newton. Now, the response of a dune system to climate change, to, to sea level rise, is to roll back. The problem is it rolls back onto the croft. That's just how it works. And croft boundaries don't roll back, so land will be lost. How do you persuade a crofter that it's actually better to allow this to happen than to resist the rollback process? I don't know. And you also have this question, whose job is it to promote this message? Probably not mine, but the problem is it might not be anybody else's either. Also, there are places in the US where there is no dune ridge and there's no sand supply to create one, such as Kilfeder and parts of Balashir. And I confess we have no answers to this. You can install more valves on the drains. That's fairly straightforward, though these things are a nightmare to maintain. With a lot of planning and a lot of advance notice and a lot of public consultation, you can start to move vulnerable structures inland to higher ground. It takes a long time. You also need to protect your seed from floods, especially saline floods, because you can't replace it. One thing that's less obvious is protecting the stone linings of drainage channels. Now they're there for a reason. There aren't stones on the Macher. These were imported with great difficulty during the construction of these drains. Why? It was to prevent erosion. Not so much because of the erosion that might occur there, but more because the sediment would be carried elsewhere in the drainage system and when the flow stopped, as at high tide, for example, this sediment would just drop and possibly block the drains. You could also add extra discharges higher in the tidal frame that will help you discharge flood water. And perhaps it is time to think about exploring the possibility of pumping. So I'm suggesting and only suggesting a situation where the local population makes the decisions about how UST goes forward here. We can supply science that is first rate because there are some very good scientists working in this field, as we saw from Coast Adapt, where the council led a project linking science and the community with great success. You have to take account of the local context and allow local people to make decisions. We have to recognize as ecologists that the interior of UIST is an engineered one and it will have an engineered solution. But the coastal edge and the dune ridge are natural and there you need nature-based solutions which are developed by reducing the pressures in terms of seed removal and grazing animals to optimize the natural processes. If you get this wrong, the consequences can be quite serious and it is entirely possible in the US as everywhere else that poorly planned, ill-advised adaptation or resistance to climate change can be more of a threat to the natural environment and those who depend on it than the climate change itself. We as scientists cannot give you answers that will guarantee safety in UIST. We can help you avoid maladaptation. maladaptation. I'm not going to describe these, just to show you the range 
of science that is available already. These papers were generated by the Council's Coast Adapt project, and there are others. So the science is important in that it provides a peer-reviewed scientific basis for adaptation planning. These papers aren't all that accessible in terms of language, but they are at least available physically in, in local sources such as the library and they've also been circulated widely within the community. I've already told you about Coast Adapt, which involved a lot of public consultation. There have been public talks which generate feedback, which improve the science. Additionally, there have been articles in local papers written in language rather more accessible than the scientific papers. You have this extreme connectivity between habitats, between habitats and land use, between habitats and economy and culture. If you change one component of this linked system, you can have a knock-on effect. Knowledge of functionality is critical so that decision-making is as well-informed as it can be. I have to say now that the next few slides, the final slides, are not instructions. They're not even pleas. It's just one guy with no connection in terms of these remarks at any organisation, just one guy's suggestions. Local people make the decisions within existing legal constraints because we can't change these. However, local people also accept responsibility for these decisions and the scientists merely inform this process. You have this huge advantage that South Eust and Benbecula are mainly owned by the community and when it comes to land use, it's the crofters who determine most of that land use and manage the common grazings. There is the well-known tragedy of the commons where because nobody, no one person organisation has direct responsibility, everything falls apart. Well, that doesn't happen in Uist because everybody seems to work very closely together. The various organisations work more closely together in the Western Isles than is the rule elsewhere so that we reduce, though not quite eliminate, the silo mentality. Maybe the problem of the commons, the tragedy of the commons, is actually the solution. Nobody can force the townships to coordinate their approach, but equally, nobody can stop them from doing so. There is power you already have. You can use it. You can coordinate the approach. You can seek advice. But then they're your decisions, your responsibility. And always, always remember in the decision-making process that everything is connected. Thank you. Thanks, Stuart, for uh, such a, I'm not sure how I get my video on here, but I'll just go with the, um, the video off and the sound on. Um, I think I might be able to get it now. So that's it. Yep. Um, so thanks. Um, despite the scary scenarios, actually, that were coming out from your talk, um, you were at least giving some straws to cling on to at the end for possible solutions and really demonstrating in all sorts of ways the uniqueness of the Uists, um, both in terms of the sheer extent of community ownership in the Outer Isles, Western Isles now being such an advantage. But also, I was very struck by your contrast between, as you said, the engineered interior of the islands and the natural uh, periphery to it, where nature-based solutions could be part of the scenario. Um, there have been questions coming in during the course of the talk. And at the moment, um, people can so-called upvote for certain questions if you're looking in the question and answer 
uh, box at the side. I've tried to keep track of some of the ones as you've been going on. Um, and I'll also keep an eye on the um, ones that seem to be popular. But while I'm keeping an eye on that, I think I should just start because obviously we have limited time tonight. And the first question that had come in was from Aidan Smith, who was asking a straightforward question. Why is it that sea level rise will be different in different places, especially in the Hebrides? The, the real issue is that the land is rising at different levels across the world. And sea level is not back level in free example there are parts of the Indian Ocean I believe that if you measure from the center of the earth are 150 meters higher than the Atlantic I'm giving that off the top of my head please take that if you want to use it but the sea is not a level playing field and the land is not a level playing field moving at different rates in different places. Thanks. Ian Maynard has um, had a lot of votes for this question, um, saying, whilst the kelp may not grow vertically, why wouldn't it colonise the newly submerged coast, thereby maintaining its relative depth? That's a good question, and it's one I get a lot. I I think that the, the, the this this is conjecture. I think the distance that the dune ridge will move will be relatively short in terms of the width of the the kelp beds, so there won't be that much extra seabed to support uh, an, a more extended kelp forest. It also relies on the beach being cleared of sand, or what is now the beach being cleared of sand to create rock, which admittedly is fairly likely. It is fairly likely that all that sand will be will, be, will roll inland. Right, yes. So it will happen, just not enough of it. Okay, not enough of it. Next question, Ewan Jenkins. Um, is there a concern that sea level rise will salinate peatlands in used Outer Hebrides and thereby dry out those wetlands and emit vast amounts of stored carbon? Could there be strategies to mitigate that? Yes, is the short answer because we've had sea level rise in the Outer, sorry, relative sea level rise in the Outer Hebrides since the last glaciation. And there is ample evidence of peat below high water mark. You can see it all over the place in the Outer Hebrides. And obviously, as sea level rises, there is likely to be more of this. The, the peat seems to retain its structure. Whether it retains its carbon or not, I don't know. Let's just assume for the sake of argument it does. And this problem might not be as acute as it first appears. But once it oxidizes, the carbon store is gone because the peak itself is gone. Interesting. And I can think even on the Murray coast of picking up, you know, bits of peat that are from, you know, quite an ancient um, peatland there. Um, Really simple, but um, very pertinent question here from Neil Kitching, who has said, can we learn from the Dutch? Yes, but is the way I'd put it, because the Dutch have a fairly short coastline in relation to their population. It is thus feasible in the Netherlands to construct huge dikes at vast expense, and there is no way anything like that is ever going to happen on the coast of Eust. And I don't think it will work anyway, because once you start building seawalls, 
you're going to carry on doing it because all the seawall does is transfer the problem to the end of the seawall. So I don't think there's anything in the in terms of the engineer defense of the coastal outline we can learn from the Dutch. But I was describing an engineered interior. And it's interesting that there appears to be evidence which we simply can't lay our hands on. There appears to be evidence that the Dutch were actually involved as engineers in the post-1744 drainage of US. And that expertise was astonishing because you've seen how flat that land is. They had no maps. It was quite astonishingly technical and brilliant, and they did it. And you, you have to admire the skill involved. Now, modern engineering and the, the manipulation of water levels inland is something we can learn a great deal from the Dutch about, and absolutely we can go there. It is quite quite astonishing thinking of the skill of the Dutch in, in both times past with things, but even in times present, I'm struck by they've been quite early in thinking about buildings that are on, um, you know, hydraulics that as water level rises, the building can go up. It's, you know, 21st century Dutch way of, of thinking. Um, Vicky is saying great presentation, thanks. Um, what support, interest or money is there from the Scottish Government and Western Isles Council um, in relation to these issues? Well, I think everybody here will realise how little money local authorities have, how little flexibility local authorities have. And when you're having to cut support for the elderly, for example, indulging in immediate responses to what is seen as a long-term problem probably isn't that, attract that attractive as a proposition. And you can hardly blame the council for that. The, the, the elderly have a problem now, theoretically can postpone the climate change adaptation for another few years. The, the problem is bigger than the local authority and the Scottish government has made 11.7 million pounds available throughout Scotland for coastal adaptation. And if you look on the Dynamic Coast website, you will see the, the strategy that they've evolved for this and the adaptation plans. And you can see that the Western Isles is in the second tranche of these, not in the first one, but in the second one. My worry, and I, I've shared this with Dynamic Coast, is that there won't be enough expertise within Scotland to meet the, the requirements within three years of the 27 coastal local authorities in Scotland, but who knows? Let, let's give it a chance and see. Mm -hmm. Worrying. And in some ways, a follow on from that question, a related one in some ways, is from Vanessa Hallhead um, saying, what is the time scale in which the people of the US will have to develop and start to implement these adaptation measures that you described? Uh, hi, Vanessa. The the time scale is unknown because of this question of the, the tipping point. This could happen next year or in 30 years or 100 years. We don't know. And one of the other unknowns that I think has been misinterpreted is that the 2005 storm was a one in 200 year storm. So we're okay for another 200 years. That isn't the way probability works. The, the probability of throwing a six with a die is one in six. And if you throw a six, the possibility of throwing another six on the next throw is still one in six. And your chance of another big storm is still one in 200. Um, Aidan Smith, I think you partly answered this earlier, but he's asking, would new kelp not gradually establish nearer the shore as the sea level rises? But I think yeah, you answered I, that in terms of the rock. I think it did. Yes, but I don't think there'd be enough of it. Okay. 
or if there was enough of it, the shore would be in a very different place, which is a different scale of problem altogether. And Natalie Ida um, was saying thank you for an excellent presentation. Would you be able to share the slides? I, I think the presentation has been recorded, so um, I assume that's probably the way through the Scottish Wildlife Trust that people might be able to see this um, at a later stage. Um, Can I just send a note of caution on this? You know, some of the maps and the aerial photography are not the property of Nature Scott. We have a license to use them, and you don't. So there, there could be a copyright issue there. Okay, I think we'll maybe yeah, we can explore that beyond yep. uh, this evening. Um, Tegan Gaetano is asking: Do you foresee solutions to challenges facing us to being interdisciplinary ones? Are there roles for social scientists, soil scientists? engineers, economists, etc. The The strategy I described is actually only part of the work we've been doing. We put together the beginnings of a bid for funding that built on the undoubted success of Coast Adapt. And it would bring academics and local people together much even more closely than Coast Adapt. But in addition to coastal scientists, we would have all these extra disciplines represented. And we've taken lessons here from a project known as CCAT, that's CCAT, uh, an Irish Welsh project. And they had four complaints about the way, sorry, local communities had four complaints about the way CCAT operated. And three of them were already covered by our project. The the fourth one, turnover of staff, we can't do anything about. It, most of the organizations encourage staff development and that's not going to change. But things like avoiding silo working, avoiding the tragedy of the commons, incorporate the local culture, we're on it. But we enhance these things as a result of the CCAT feedback. It's very encouraging. Um, Katrina is asking, would the manure from smaller grazing animals not help the grasses and marin to grow and stabilise the dunes? Yes, is the short answer. But you have to be careful with what you introduce to the environment. It is at least an organic product that will break down. And I think we've got to be very careful what we put into this dune ridge if it's moving. And that applies even to the barbed wire I was describing as a recommendation for the dune ridge. But yes is the simple answer, and some people do. But remember, everything's connected. And not all of that manure breaks down over the, the, the next season. And you've got islands that rely very heavily on tourism for their income. And it really doesn't help if you've got great piles of cow dung all over the place. So with care, I would say, I remember everything's connected. Including cow dung in your boots sometimes. So, um, yeah, an anonymous uh, person here, anonymous attendee, whoops, just... Um, yeah, uh, the questions are going bonkers at the side here. Forgive me, I'm just trying to scroll up to see what's going on. So first anonymous attendee has asked, should the rest of the coastal UK be looked at in this way? I imagine there is quite a lot going on, but in what's the wider context? There is a lot going on. There are other areas we're looking at. We've deliberately fastened on US for two reasons. One is that the situation is fairly extreme and we can learn a lot from US that can then be applied elsewhere, including the, the other places I mentioned in the same breath, if you like, Orkney, Tyree and Isla. 
but there are people looking at different parts of the coast to get a different focus. And I said, there were two reasons. The other reason is I love working in UST. I love Macher, I love being in UST. And it's, it's, it's also been very productive scientifically. It has yielded results. And I thank local people immeasurably for their contribution to that. Another anonymous attendee and link to what you've just said, saying, uh, they're saying um, what community-led initiatives are already underway for uh, adaptation in the Outer Hebrides? We have an Outer Hebrides Community Planning Partnership Climate Change Group, which has a very wide representation. It is chaired by my colleague, David McLennan, who is the area manager for a much larger area than I once covered. And in addition, there are flood management groups in UIST. And I know that my, my old friend, David Muir, who used to be the coastal zone manager and organized coast adapt, is closely involved in at least one of these. So that there are local responses. There are local things happening. And I know that they are already linking with scientists. So part of this, is already happening, I think largely because of post adapt and all credit to the Council for devising that credit. Yes. Another um, anonymous person saying, has the land dries after the ice sheet melting at the end of the last ice age now stopped? No, it hasn't. The problem is that on all of the Scottish coast, sea level rise is now outpacing land level rise. So the, the history, until the fairly recent past, of rising coasts and the creation of raised beaches is over. And I, I rely on the, the work of my, I, my friends, Alistair Rennie and Hansen, for this. And we, we actually have a problem with scientists believing that Scotland is okay because it's rising. It's not rising fast enough, folks. Yes. Um, you have covered some of this really, I think, but maybe to you know, want to reiterate, Karen is asking, um, what in your opinion is the key activity that should be done to alleviate the situation? Um, and you said that communities should use their powers, but to do what exactly and how? So that kind of over, you know, you, you have discussed some of that. Uh, I think I have. I mean, the, the, the last section of the talk addressed the strategic response that I think could be embarked upon to improve the resilience of UST. And in particular, I mentioned the, the management of the Dune Ridge and the management of the drainage network. Now, yeah. a lot of that could be done now without additional funding. But it needs it needs universal engagement, and that's never going to be easy. I'll have to romp through. I'm aware that the time is um, coming to a close now, and their questions are still, it shows the um, level of interest in what you've been saying, Stuart, that questions are still coming in thick and fast, but uh, we'll probably have to stop pretty soon. Michael Reed is saying, could there be a role for citizen scientists in monitoring changes in things like salinity, species distribution, etc.? Yes, it's a short answer. Yep. Um, that's good. And Bruce here, would very large kelp farms offshore assist? Uh, and he says, we intend cultivating kelp at scale on sites of about 100 hectares on the west coast. Um, and that's thanks from Bruce from the Cali Cali group. I think people who advocate things like wave energy converters and seaweed farms off the west of the US, of the US underestimate the ferocity of winter gales in this environment, managing any sort of structure, whether it's a seaweed farm 
or a wave energy converter, or for that matter, an oil rig, is a major technological challenge, as is servicing that equipment. I think we'll maybe need to make this the last um, question to allow time for John to, to round up. Jan is asking something you mentioned right at the start, actually. Why will sea level keep rising even um, if we reach net zero carbon? There isn't a simple answer to that, I'm afraid. I can explain it in terms of the source of most of the sea level rise. There is a certain element of the water expanding as the earth gets warmer, but the main source of rising sea level is melting terrestrial ice. And most, not all, but most of that ice is at the poles, lying on top of places like Greenland and the Antarctic. Sea ice does not contribute to sea level rise when it melts, it's neutral. So this is ice on the land. And the problem is that once that ice melts, instead of being white, the land surface is black or dark. So that instead of reflecting heat via what is known as its albedo, by being white, it is dark and absorbing heat and the process continues. I'm sure there is much more to it than that, but these are the things that spring immediately to mind. Thanks, and yet another example of everything being connected sometimes in ways that we would um, yeah. cheerfully do without. Um, I'll hand over now to John Cromarty to conclude the proceedings for this evening. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed, Kenny, for chairing that questions and discussion session. And it's clear that uh, the questions are still coming and we still have a, <clears throat> a large proportion <clears throat> of our participants online. So that's just great. So many people have stayed to hear uh, the interesting a uh, range of questions and, and your answers, uh, Stuart. So I, it would be impossible to attempt to briefly summarize uh, your excellent presentation. So I would, I would just say, uh, Stuart, echoing, I guess, the expressed and the posted sentiments of many of tonight's participants, what, what an interesting and informative talk that you have given us. Thank you. Um, Seldom, I think, have I heard uh, such a well-structured presentation describing so clearly events which the uninitiated might consider to be relatively straightforward, but which are in fact very complex, interconnected and interdependent. Thank you so much for your very clear analysis of what we know, what we need to know still, and what can be done to contain, to accommodate, or to adapt to the threats of climate change. Um, I was also, I think, during uh, several aspects of your presentation, fascinated by the little snippets of history, which you managed to weave seamlessly into the fabric of your talk, like scattered little jewels of additional interest for me, and I guess for many of our participants tonight. So in, in very brief summary, I would say that tonight we have certainly learned two main things out of your talk, which you've, you've taken great care to emphasize and to theme throughout your whole presentation. And, and that is, first of all, um, there are multiple components which are all interconnected and we must be mindful of that and also mindful of the complexity of these interactions when potentially trying to seek what might be oversimplified solutions to very complex problems. Secondly, um, I think you have made it very clear that local populations need to make the decisions on what happens based on sound scientific advice. And we need nature-based solutions from organizations and from scientists and from the local population working in a coordinated way. It's very reassuring to hear you say that in fact, you is this a very good chance of achieving this because of the coordinated way in which the community works in Uist. And that's quite heartening, given the complexities, given the inevitability 
of what we're looking at and seeing through climate change. So thank you for uh, presenting such a well-structured talk, for taking us through so much data with such clear explanation and for giving us some hope um, that there is a way uh, in which we can accommodate and adapt and change to minimise the impact of, of, of climate change um, and of sea level rises, which are going to happen, uh, whatever happens. So it's been a really fascinating talk and thank you very much. I know people's microphones aren't on, but if we could switch everyone's mic microphones on, you would have a very hearty round of applause. So I'll give you one anyway, uh, as loudly as I can. Thank you very much indeed. So just before closing, um, I just have a couple of brief announcements to make. Thank you all for staying with us for so long. Much appreciated. I just want to say what our next two meetings are for the North of Scotland local group. First of all, on Wednesday, the 12th of April, we have a presentation on bird song identification. Very appropriate uh, for the beginning of spring, I think. And this will be followed by our annual general meeting. The presentation is going to be given by Dan Poplett. Dan's our vice chair, and he's a naturalist. Uh, a conservationist and an environmental educator. And he'll take us through not only how to identify bird songs, but how to remember particular bird songs. I'm sure we've all been uh, fascinated by those of us who access it readily uh, by the Dawn Chorus, uh, which has become ever more evident in, in recent weeks. Uh, but how good are we at actually identifying individual bird songs and how do you remember which is which? So uh, it'll be an excellent presentation, I can assure you, and I would recommend that particular uh, event to you, Wednesday the 12th of April. And that concludes uh, our 2022-23 programme of Zoom events, and then we start our summer outings. And the first summer outing uh, for uh, this coming summer will be Saturday the 20th of May, and it will be about restoring the River Fintorn, um, and it will be led by Bob Lawton and Elsie Cox of the Fintorn, Nairn and Lossie R Rivers Trust. And this will explore the ecological restoration of, of the River Fintorn. So I hope that certainly those of you in the local group can join us for that. But of course, uh, such presentations are also available to, to others to be meant to when they see the link. So we'd encourage you to attend those. Finally, can I thank the very, very many participants who, who have come along and been part of this evening. Thank you so much for coming in from across Scotland tonight. I hope you've enjoyed the topic. It's been fascinating, it's been detailed, and it's been very well presented. So just in final conclusion, once again, Professor Stuart Angus, thank you so much for such an enjoyable, informative, and interesting talk. Very much appreciated. Thank you so much. And good night to everyone. Thank you for participating. Bye-bye.